Awesome. So uh, why don't we go in the order uh, left to right from the first slide? Anish, if you want to start. Hi, uh, my name is Anish. So I'm a sophomore and I'm studying ECCF. Oh, Anish, Anish. you're a little, a little soft, a little quiet. Um, is this better? No. Um, it still not, not feels really a little quiet. Okay. Um, I, I hope this is better. Okay, yeah, cool. that's better. So my name is Anish. Um, I'm a sophomore and I'm studying ECCS. Am I Nest or? or? Yeah. Okay. I'm Nora. I'm also a sophomore. I'm studying mathematics and computer science. Scott, uh, Scott, you're muted. <laughs> oh, hi guys. Uh, I'm Scott. I'm a junior. I'm studying uh, computer science and statistics. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, hello, everyone. I'm Vivek. I'm a master's student in uh, data science program here and I'll be graduating in less than two weeks. Hey, I'm Winston, I'm a sophomore, and I study physics and public policy. Hi, I'm Jason, I'm a junior, and I study computer science. Hey everyone, I'm Gaurav, uh, I'm a senior, uh, and I'm studying mechanical engineering with the INE certificate. All right, so just before I begin, uh, Kyle, thumbs up if you, if you can hear me. Everything good? Awesome. Ready to go? Go ahead. Perfect. <clears throat> All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're here to talk about building a wider lens on energy, adapting deep learning techniques to inform energy access decisions. Our team members this year have been Anish, Nora, Ayo, Scott, Vivek, Winston, and myself, Gorb. Next slide, please. So we, let's begin with the problem. Today, 1 billion people around the world still lack access to electricity. But why does this matter? Well, energy access is correlated with a large number of social, health, and economic development factors. Most directly, electricity access gives us energy for industrialization. There are a number of other important correlations with energy access. Next slide. A 2015 study from UC Berkeley showed us that there is an inverse correlation between energy access and maternal mortality, meaning improved access can ensure that more mothers survive during childbirth. Next slide. This study also showed us that energy access is directly correlated with education. If you look at this plot, the number of students in grade one who finish their primary education shows a direct correlation with energy access. Next slide, please. And finally, energy access is deeply tied to economic development. The number of people living on less than $1 a day goes down as energy access goes up. As we can see, electricity is an essential cog in the wheel of progress. Next slide. When we look at the globe, some regions are most affected. In fact, 87% of people without electricity live in rural regions. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Urban areas have 75% electrification, while rural areas have 25%. But how do we reach these remote regions? Next slide, please. Often, remote regions are hard to access, and data on electrification is sparse. When trying to expand energy access in a country, policymakers typically have three options. One is grid expansion, meaning they extend their national network. Two is building a microgrid for an entire rural community, and three is targeted off-grid solar PV systems, which give direct power by the kilowatt. In order to figure out what method of expansion is best for a region, decision makers need to know where current infrastructure lies. Next slide, please. So how do we keep track of infrastructure? Mapping infrastructure is expensive and time consuming. In the US, many cities have records of infrastructure planning and development. However, for the rest of the world, Individual household surveys are aggregated and scaled to estimate access. This is expensive and time consuming. So how can we automate this process using satellite imagery? This is where we come in. Next slide. Our goal is to build a tool that researchers can use to identify and map out global energy infrastructure to supplement existing information 
and allow policymakers and businesses to make informed decisions on expanding electricity access. Now I will hand it off to Vivek who will lay the foundations of our research. So our existing methodology is to use convolutional neural networks, which is a kind of a deep learning model to identify an energy infrastructure in satellite images. So our first step is to obtain high resolution satellite imagery, which is shown in the uh, first box in which various infrastructure such as building, car, tower, they are clearly visible. L using low resolution images won't give higher prediction accuracy. Then the second step is to use the model to detect different objects in the training data set, such as energy infrastructure, such as transmission lines and towers, in addition to cars and buildings. The identified objects are bounded by the blue boxes. And finally, the model is tested on new images, where each identified object shown in the red boxes is assigned a probability score of being belonging to a certain class. Next slide, please. So we are building on last year team work, team's work and our main goal this year has been to make a model generalized across different geographies. In order to achieve that, we need labeled satellite image where each object is identified in the training data set then we pass that image through a neural network or model. And then as an output, we get a segmented image where the white pixels are the object of interest, such as the building that the model has identified and black pixels are the area which are of not, which are not of interest to us. Next slide, please. So I'll not uh, talk about the model in the data, but before talking about that, uh, I'll talk about some of the key metrics that are used to assess the performance of the model. The output of the model is the predicted bounding boxes around the object of interest. In <clears throat> order to uh, use these three metrics, we have the ground truth bounding boxes, that is the hand labeled bounding boxes from the testing set that specify where in the image our object is, and the predicted bounding box or the detected bounding. Uh, shows as a detected box from a model. So for all the three metrics, the precision recall and IOU, which is the intersection over union. In the numerator, we computing the area of overlap between the predicted bounding box and the ground truth bounding box. For the precision, in the denominator, it is the area of the detected box. For recall, the denomin denominator is the area of the ground truth bounding box. And for intersection over union, the denominator is, is the area of the union, or more simply the area encompassed by both the predicted bounding box and the ground truth bounding box. So uh, to put it simply, precision measures how accurate are the predictions, that is the percentage of your presentation, uh, percentage of predictions that are correct. Recall measures how good you find all the positives. And intersection of a union gives the total accuracy for a model. Next slide, please. So here the task was to identify the transmission line across the four cities shown in this <coughs> slide. The black USA model, it uh, shows uh, that the model has been trained on all the four locations. This precision recall curve is used to uh, estimate the effectiveness of our model. So higher the area under the precision recall curve, higher is the accuracy of our model. So uh, for the first graph, if you see the model that has been trained on Arizona AZ, that gives the highest uh, predict, uh, highest performance only on the first uh, uh, when it is tested across Arizona only, and the performance drops significantly across all the other three. But the model, the black model, which has been trained on all the four cities, gives the highest prediction in all the four cases. Next slide, please. Here, the task was to identify the buildings from the INRIA data set. So the numbers show the intersection over union. And we can see the, uh, the, in the rows, we have the training cities. And, in that, and the model was tested on the same cities in the columns. So suppose the Chicago, uh, the model that has been trained on Chicago performs well when it is tested on Chicago only. It doesn't perform well when it is tested on other cities. Next slide, please. However, when the model has been trained on all the cities, it gives perform, uh, best performance across all the other cities in all the different cases. 
So the average performance mm-hmm. in different geographies, it increased by 26.5%. Next slide, please. So why are we uh, getting drop in performance across different regions? The reason is that each geography is incredibly different. Here I've shown the city images for uh, four cities, and these are pulled from the Google Earth. These are at the 500 meter resi- resolution. Uh, sorry, 500 meter. Uh, the height of the camera is the 500 meters. So if you can see in the Austin, the buildings are widely spaced as compared to the Chicago and Vienna, where <clears throat> the buildings are more tightly spaced and uh, the Kitsap has more green cover and the color of the green is uh, more greener in the Kitsap. And we see in the Vienna, the rooftops are very distinct. It has the red uh, roof, the texture of the rooftops is red. So we see that color gradient structure, how the buildings are spaced. Everything is different in all the four, in all the four geographies. Next slide, please. However, we still lack like these kind of labeled images. So that's why we want to use the idea of synthetic images. On the left, there's a <clears throat> real synth- uh, satellite images. And on the right, there is a synthetic image uh, that has been generated in the city engine. So if we have high quality and correctly annotated satellite images, then uh, we would obviate the step of manu- uh, manual annotation and we make our training data set more richer. That would increase the performance of a model in the real world. Next slide, please. So as a proof of concept, we need actually the labeled data set <coughs> for our satellite images. But to get the complete labeled data set for the each and every infrastructure in the satellite image, those are very difficult to obtain. So we have started with the INRIA data set. We already, where already we have the label data set for the buildings. So as we can see in the left, this is the Austin image from the INRIA data set. And on the right is the ground truth image of the Austin, where all the buildings have been marked uh, uh, in the white. So I now hand out to Anish to explain our work on the synthetic images. Okay. To sort of explain our goal over here, it's to increase adaptability over geographies. And what we want to do here is supplement our original actual satellite images with some synthetic examples. And this, this allows us to sort of introduce an element of randomness and increase the diversity of the data we're training on. So over here, we see like three synthetic images. And these represent styles from, for example, like Paris or Venice. And like the third one is a generic red roof style. And you want to input these along with the actual authentic satellite images we have into our neural network. Can you go to the next slide, please? It's actually the next slide. I think it's uh, not correct. Like it's the buffering. I think there's, yeah, it's actually the next slide. Right. Um, So as a proof of concept, our work focused on dealing with data sets that had annotated buildings in them. So to extend this, to sort of solve, work towards solving the problem of energy infrastructure, this was the first step because we already had access to building data, which was properly annotated and stuff that we could run our experiments on. So over here, for example, we have a side side image of Austin and the ground truth image to accompany it shows in white all the location of all the buildings and the black shows anything that is not a building. Next slide, please. So this is sort of where we transition into the challenges that our team faced and the different tools we sort of developed to solve these challenges. Next slide. So with the advent of synthetic imagery, like we just mentioned, there are still a couple of challenges that rise. So on the screen, you can see three different examples of synthetically generated images. As you can probably figure out, these are still a bit textural in terms of texture different from what you would count as authentic imagery. You can see like how the how visually like the rooftops appear, how the greenery appears. It's still a step away from actual real satellite imagery. To sort of bridge that gap of quality, can we go to the next slide, please? We propose transferring textures from real images onto synthetic images. As an example, we can pick up, for example, roof textures from real images, manipulate them, and then place them onto synthetic images wherever the roof is required. We can do so with similarly other textures, like, for example, green tree or roads or water bodies and so on. Next slide, please. So, right, just to give an overview of the process that our team adopted. 
we take a satellite image, which is a real satellite image from the NVIDIA data set. So because we want to focus on extracting roof textures, we extract all the buildings in the rooftops from the input images. Then we synthesize textures from them and generate loads and loads of textures. Once we have a diverse enough catalog of textures, we sort of substitute these onto satellite images and see what our output looks like. So let's focus on the first step here, which is extracting building rooftops. Next slide, please. So the first thing we need to do over here is narrow down only to buildings. So on the left, we had an input satellite image that had everything, greenery, roads, cars, et cetera, et cetera. On the right, we narrowed down to the only, build, only the buildings and only the rooftops present in this image. Next slide, please. Once we have all the buildings isolated, we go through all the roofs. For each roof, we then make a bounding box that contains nothing but only that specific roof. One algorithm that we developed over here helps us in extracting rectangular patches from all the roofs given in, in an image. And using these extracted rectangles, we can then feed them onto the synthetic texture generation process. Next slide, please. So these are some examples of rooftops that we isolated and some rectangular patches we extracted from them. As you can probably see, many of the rooftops are weird geometries. They're not perfect rectangles. They're really complex polygons in, the, in some cases. So our, our tool over here, it auto extract rectangular patches from these buildings. I'll now hand over to Scott to explain how the synthetic texture generation kicks in over here. So just to give you an overview, we're at the second step of our automated pipeline now. After we've extracted the building rooftops, now we want to synthesize textures and generate new textures for our catalog. So before I get into that, I just kind of want to explain what is texture synthesis. And texture synthesis is basically the method of uh, getting the artistic stylings and textures of an image and generating an entirely new synthetic image with these artistic stylings and textures. How this is done is by using a feed-forward generative, generative adversary network. As you can see as an example, on the left, we have an input image of red peppers. And this is real. What the network does is it uh, uh, captures the artistic stylings and the textures, and it generates an entirely new synthetic image on the right. Let's see how this performs on our roofs. So early on in our first step, as Anish has explained, we have an extracted roof. We take the auto extracted rectangles from them. We run it through the model and it outputs as synthesized roof textures. Now, our animation in the middle there, as you can see, is the model iteratively generating a more increasingly accurate texture of the roof. As you can see, the output is pretty accurate to the original image. And this also extends to different kinds of roofs. So we ran our network across different kinds of roofs using different textures and different colors. And all of them seemed pretty accurate. Now it's important to understand that this model is powerful because one, it is regardless of the input size, we can always generate an output texture with a standardized size. Second, it maintains image resolution. So no matter how small your input roof could be, your output size could always be the same. And lastly, it accurately transfers artistic styles and textures. All right, now we want to apply this technique to increase the diversity of our texture patch catalog by synthesizing and generating texture patches from buildings across all five cities in the NREA public data set that we used as well as um, landscapes to create a synthetic texture database. Next slide. All right, so as you can see here on the left, this is an image of the city of Vienna. Um, in this Vienna image, for instance, we extracted four very different roofs, each of a different gradient, color, and rooftop tech structure. And each of them is numbered and then put through our texture synthesis automated pipeline to be synthesized and reconstituted into texture patches, as you can see on the right here. Next slide. All right, so recall that we really want to tackle the diversity of our data problem head on. So this is where our project will head to next, creating more diversity in landscape and infrastructure types. Already we are seeing successes applying our model upon forests, rivers, car parks, and farm fields. So one can envision creating a whole scene or a simulated environment 
with the buildings made up using our rooftop texture bank with roads, cars, rolling hills, and more. Then we will be a step closer to truly being geography agnostic and can create different kinds of scenes that can be closer to the actual landscapes in developing nations. Next slide. And now I'll head on, I'll leave it to the next presenter. Hi, uh, I'm Jason. I'll be talking about the last part pipeline, which is texture substitution. Um, so now that we've extracted rooftops and sourced images and generated synthetic textures, we want to substitute these synthesized textures to new target geographies. Um, next slide, please. Well, how do we do that? Um, so here we can see an example of a source satellite image from uh, Vienna. We've generated a synthetic texture patch using a specific building from Vienna. Um, and below, we can see a target satellite image from Austin. Our goal is to use the synthesized texture patches and substitute these onto our target geography. It's important to note that we don't do this arbitrarily. Um, next slide, please. Um, so before we substitute our synthesized textures onto the rooftops of our target geography, uh, we first look at a pixel distribution of the buildings from our target domain. Uh, we then decide on sizing buckets, which basically means like what groups of buildings uh, do we consider to be small buildings, which we consider to be medium sized, and um, which, which do we consider to be large sized. And when we synthesize the synthetic textures, we also note the size of the building that, this, that the texture was synthesized from. So we're able to find a synthetic texture of similar size to substitute onto the target building. This ensures that our final output is as realistic as possible, um, since we can imagine that small and large buildings have, um, could have notable differences in rooftop textures. Next slide, please. Um, so here we can see an example of an output of our texture substitution process. You may notice that the rooftops look like solid colors, and this result uh, reflects the process by which we're substituting the synthesized textures in. Uh, next slide, please. When we substitute in the textures, uh, we start from the left corner, uh, the upper left corner of the texture patch and the upper left corner of the building. And each pixel is substituted into the corresponding relative pixel location uh, on the rooftop. The quality of the, the textures is not the best right now, but this is mainly for a proof of concept. Um, we can imagine that if we start generating textures of high resolution and input these into a city generating software, such as City Engine, um, we can generate rooftops that are more realistic and carry the properties of real rooftops. Next slide, please. Um, so here we see the full process of texture substitution on a specific rooftop. First, we find a target rooftop and detect the, um, the borders of the rooftop using our uh, rooftop extraction extraction process. We then find a source texture of similar size and substitute the texture onto the single rooftop using the process that was mentioned uh, before. Next slide, please. So where does this bring us? Um, at this point, we can supplement our real satellite imagery with textured synthetic imagery um, where the rooftops have been replaced. This will allow us to convincingly represent new regions and create more accurate building maps. As this research progresses, the team will expand this pipeline to other types of infrastructure besides buildings and eventually allow us to map out energy grids around the world. Um, now we'll go back to Winston, who will talk about some of the potential applications of our project. All right, so there are two main ways where our project can make an impact. First of all, we want to provide more diverse training data for researchers to enhance their work on object detection or segmentation. Because of how precious and expensive training data is, synthetic image database that we created using the automated pipeline TSAP will be immensely helpful. For instance, Facebook has a team that seeks to identify energy infrastructure as well, but they're hampered by the lack of labeled images of the regions they're targeting. This is where we can be helpful. And the other aspect is by informing businesses and policymakers on grid strategies in places with little knowledge of energy access on the ground. 
It could aid the process of automatically detecting electrified communities and improve efficiency and maintenance or upgrade of grids by providing a map of the existing infrastructure and where possible damages could be. Another way we can really help lower costs for developing a grid strategy is by helping stakeholders identify the gaps in electricity access. Whether they want to extend the transmission lines, which is cheaper in locales closer to existing grid infrastructure, by mapping grid extension versus distributing just distributed generation system costs based on distance from the nearest transmission line. And then a few other options include developing microgrids or off-grid energy generation systems, where our maps can tell entrepreneurs or businesses where communities exist that lack electricity access, but have an income level where they have the ability to pay for electricity to do so. For instance, companies that want to deploy electronic technology and sparsely populated areas will need information on if the areas of interest have uh, access to electricity. A closer example at home is we actually have an energy access project that is working on a consortium with a sub-Saharan uh, African government utility and private providers to organize expanding electricity access in that country. And that is where our work can really be applied and tested there. The same thing applies for government where they can work with private sector to see where they fall short so that the government can step in, provide public finance and state support for expansion. And finally, this can be used beyond energy as well, like crop identification, agriculture, disaster damage detection, or foreign object detection and for national security use. Now I'll uh, give Nora to talk about uh, future steps of the project. Thank you, Winston, for introducing some of our potential applications. So for a more detailed plan in the near future, next slide, please. We would like to start with using this pipeline that we de develop in this project, which is texture extraction, texture synthesis, and texture substituting DNA to generate a data set of synthetic cities. And this time, we'll also try to incorporate other textures, not only rooftop, but things like forests, rivers, roads, and cars that we mentioned previously. So next slide, please. And then we will train and test our semantic segmentation models on the mixed data sets, which is the combination of satellite imagery and realistic synthetic cities. So this table shows the same cross domain comparison that we did before, only with addition to the synthetic data. So next slide, please. And lastly, we hope to generalize synthetic geographic data for more developing nations. And eventually we hope to be able to expand to all geographies so that we can map out energy grants worldwide. And next slide, please. And in terms of providing support for future teams, we have our GitHub resource and our website presentation prepared. And the website is still under construction and we expect it to be completed by the end of April. Next slide, please. And as the last part of the presentation, we would like to give our special thanks to Dr. Kyle Bradbury, our program instructor who always offers the most professional comments and warmest encouragement whenever we see obstacles or progress along the way. And our extremely supportive faculty advisors, Dr. Leslie Collins, Dr. Luana Lima, Dr. Jordan Maylove, and Bahao Huang and Wang Hu. Thank you for all your support and guidance along the way. And we really appreciate the opportunity and platform offered by Duke Bass Connections Program and Duke Energy Initiative. And next slide, please. And finally, our amazing team. Well, this is a photo of us just getting out from the most difficult escape room at the beginning of this academic year last fall. Well, we just knew each other. I want to say that um, this year wouldn't be as meaningful and enjoyable if without any one of you. So thank you. And that's the end of our presentation. Next slide, please. So thank you all for listening. And